Hi guys, uh, welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, we don't have an image of the week this week. Uh, I'm sitting in for Adam, and uh, we're going to be back uh, in about two weeks. We're going to have to take the next two weeks off after this one. Uh, I, I want to, before we move on to our guest speaker, I want to talk about uh, Warren Keller has. Uh, um Pix Insight workshop in Dallas in March 22nd to 24th uh one if you uh, ip4ap is their website so you could go over there for a sign up and uh, tonight we're going to have guest on Bodette from Innovations Foresight he's going to be telling us about some new products mm -hmm. that he has uh software products so uh guest on are you there Yes, I'm here. Okay, you can take over. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I guess, good evening. My uh, presentation today is about a product uh, named SkyGuard. In fact, it's, well, there are two products, but uh, SkyGuard is the more advanced one, so I'm going to stick on this one and say a few words about uh, uh, the other one. So I think a year and a half ago, it was April 2017, I gave in the same channel a presentation on uh, a technology named full frame guiding and, and, and focusing. And I had at the time a prototype software I could use to show you how does it work. Now, I'm, what I'm going to show you today is, is a product which now is available for download. And this product uh, is doing live uh, focusing and, and guiding. So it's made of, in fact, two products. One is known as Sky Guide, and Sky Guide does full frame guiding. And Sky Guard, the one I'm going to talk about today, is doing full frame guiding as well as live focusing. If you have an on-axis guider, you can do the same thing than another software like Fo Focus Lock does, which is keeping the focus live uh, all the time while you are e imaging with your, uh, your your system. Both uh, are ASCOM compliant software, so if you have ASCOM uh, driver for your uh, devices, you can use it. It's also able to work with uh, Maxim DL version 5 and 6 in native, but you don't have to do that. You can, but you don't have to do. This is a 32-bit application at that stage because the compatibility with Maxim for the people who wants to use Maxim native. Uh, however, we have a 64 bits coming, which will be as commonly. Anyway, in this demonstration, I'm going to show you uh, an example <coughs> where I use it with uh, Skyax instead, just to give you an, an idea how does it work uh, more globally. Now, I was expecting to do the demonstration on the sky with the observatory there, but you probably noticed lately the weather has been quite difficult, and uh, I have to use my plan B, which is using my uh, bench at the lab. I have an optical bench, and at the lab, what's nice is the weather is always perfect. So I can use it to show you a bit does it, how does it work. Some of you already have seen the bench, but let me show you. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. You let me know if you see my screen. Should come soon. Do you see it? We can see. Yes, okay, so what you see is a slide from a presentation I made on another topic some time ago. But this is the bench itself, which is in front of me as we speak. So the bench is made of a smaller refractor. Uh, it's 90 millimeter f uh, 500 millimeter focal length, and if in front of it there is a flat mirror. On the back of the scope there is a focuser which is a sample uh, TSF from Uptech with, you know, controlled through a USB cable to my uh, uh, PC. The blue box on the back of it is my own made adaptive optics. I made it long ago for myself. It's, it's not a product, it's just a, a toy. Uh, there is a tilt tip window in it, and uh, here there is uh, there are a couple of steppers, and then there is a cable to a controller. This optic can be controlled by a simple ST4 connection like you do with a mount. The goal of the focuser over here and the adaptive optics there is to do both, is to show you uh, focusing, 
as well uh, as uh, guiding on the bench. On the back of the auto, uh, the adaptive optic, there is an uh, an axis guider, and on the uh, <coughs> imaging port of the an uh, axis guider, I use instead of a camera, I use a slide with a light source. That's my artificial sky, and this one is perfect. You know, there is no cloud, nothing, so we good this night. And on the other side, there is a guider. By the way, the guider is connected, of course, uh, with a cable to my PC. Uh, it's a USB 2 connection here. Uh, it's maybe not as fast as it could be, but it's a Z0 16, uh, 1600 monochrome. And, and also what we don't see, there is another cable leaving this uh, uh, on the ST4 port of the guider to connect to the controller of the adaptive optic. This way I can show you the, uh, uh, the uh, live demonstration of the auto guiding. Now about the slide itself, I need to show you um, here what the slide looks like before you see it live. That's a slide of the Ale Comet picture I took in 1986 when I won in Madagascar back then. I took plenty of pictures of the comet, but this one is a 10 minute exposure. Uh, and I was guiding with my C8. Of course, uh, I was guiding by hand. At the time, we didn't have any auto guiding capability, nor CCD or CMOS sensor. This is why I have a slide. So I'm going to use this slide. So you're going to see a comet and stars in this presentation. And I'm going to use them to show you how those, this system works. Now, look at the star on the star field. You see they are elongated. Well, there's nothing wrong with my optics, nothing wrong with the tracking, or nothing wrong with the algorithm and everything you're going to see. It's just the consequence of, of the, the image when I took it. I was guiding the I was tracking the comet. So the comet moved. Uh, over the sky, uh, the, the star field during the exposure. So it's why the star trail a bit. But it doesn't matter because this full frame technology doesn't care about the shape or the stars. It's taking every pattern in the field of view for the process of guiding and focusing. So having one star or many stars or something else is, is not relevant. The shape doesn't matter. Therefore, if they are elongated, we don't care. But I just want to, you understand, bef you know, before I start, why the star looks a bit ugly. That's because I was tracking the comet. Okay, let's go back to uh, to the software. So now I'm running the SkyX. Normally, I should be uh, connected to my Paramount, but because I had to close the observatory, here I am connected to a sample uh, ASCOM uh, simulator of the of the of the mount. And also, I have connected the simulator for the imaging and a camera and the filter wheel because I don't have any on the bench. I have only a guider, but that allows me to take a picture and simulate what would happen with an actual imager, change the filter and see what's happened, and also, of course, uh, slew the scope and see what's happened. Now, let me start the software itself. <coughs> oh, by the way, you see the simulators of the here you know, of, of the scope and the filter wheel. If I start the sim, let's close this and just put that in. And now I sc start SkyGuard. I'm going to talk about SkyGuard because he does guiding and focusing. If you, and he asked me if I want Maxim, I say, I don't need it today. Uh, SkyGuard is just the, the, the guiding side. So it's better to talk about the more comple complete product. Okay, this is what it looks like. You can you can read well the uh, interface. You can see it. You can hear me. Yes, we can see good. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, what you see here there are a couple of of uh, of windows, but before we talk about what they do, I'm going first to look at the instrument tab. The first things you need to do before you can use the, the, the software is to uh, define your uh, your instrument. So you don't have to define many, but you can define several of them. If you have different setups, it may be handy. So you can move from one setup to the next. Here I have two setups. One is the observatory, which unfortunately I cannot use today. The other one is an optical bench, the one you saw. So on this one, you see you have to give a name, a description, the focal length, which is used for the calculation of the pixel size and arc second, the aperture, the scope. You don't have to connect 
connect a scope. If you don't connect a scope, then you wouldn't have the deck and peer side information. You have to provide that by hand. But if you connect a scope, uh, like I do here, I'm connecting um, uh, to the simulator, the same one. I'm sharing the same scope than uh, SkyX. So uh, I can do that uh, here. I can use uh, this uh, slew detector. You will see what it means. The software can monitor if the, the, the scope is moving at the mount and automatically stop and restart uh, guiding and focusing over the night. Uh, the focuser here is an optech. And uh, my my uh, <clears throat> my uh, main camera is connected to ASCOM. You can connect to Maxim, but today I'm not going to use Maxim as commonly, uh, which is a simulator as well for the camera. The filter wheel is a simulator with those filters. As far as guiding goes, the output of the guider is through ASCOM. I could use Maxim for that. That would make sense, I guess, if you don't have an ASCOM driver for your camera because you have an old guider and you have only a native uh, driver uh, on Maxim, so you could use Maxim to get the image. If you do so, though, uh, it's going to be slower because the way Maxim works is a 32-bit application with a COM server. It's a bit an old technology. It's not very fast when it broadcasts images. Also, another point, which is a limitation in this 32-bit version, it wouldn't be a limitation on the coming 64 bits, but as long as we have a legacy with Maxim, even if we don't use it in the 32-bit version, we are limited to one megapixel for the image from the guider. You will see a way, uh, few ways to work around that problem if it's a problem, but the 64-bit wouldn't have such limitation anymore anyway. Now, the guider control uh, is what type of algorithm in, is in charge of guiding. Here we're going to use our Sky Surveyor. That's the name of the suite of software which includes Sky Guide and Sky Guard, which is a full frame technology. You can use Maxim if you wish, but it wouldn't make any sense because if you do so, you will be a single one star centroid calculation uh, done by Maxim. So the point is here is to show uh, everything uh, full frame. And the gu guider relay, in my case, I'm going to send the correction directly to the camera. Uh, um, so, and the ST4 connection from the camera to the adaptive optic, which is like if I have a mount. But you can go through the telescope. That would have been my connection if I was using the observatory with my paramount. Now, guiding and focusing, you have to select which algorithm. So far, there is only one available, which is uh, version one. The capability is available for you because you have a, um, a focuser connector. is guiding and focusing. The camera for guiding is uh, the, the red one you saw, the ZO 1600 monochrome, uncooled. And the size of the pixel is way smaller than the camera. That The main reason is because I had to tweak here the pixel size to match the optical um, <coughs> optical scale of the bench versus the, the setup used when I took the picture uh, for, the, for the slide of the comet. That's only why those pixels are so small. No, normally, they are more like 5.8 microns. Anyway, so when I'm done with that, I can select either of those, activate them. They are both ac accessible now. I can connect the instrument if I want over here. You see, it tells me it's tracking. And this is um, altitude, peer side, RA and deck values coming from uh, the uh, here from the uh, simulator of the scope, and also on the control of uh, the SkyX. And I can go here and start. So the first things I would do before we do uh, guiding is to go to the uh, explanation a bit about what those different um, windows or panels uh, are showing. The first one here is about data acquisition from the camera. Now here I'm going to use a guider, but I could use any camera I want, including the imaging camera if I wish. If I'm only guiding, for instance, and I want to guide full frame on the image. I can take one camera to do that. Could be the same camera than, than imaging. So I could use a single camera approach where I'm guiding and imaging with the same camera, my, my imaging camera. We have the option, actually, already to uh, store the frames coming from the camera, all of them, is if you wish, and uh, raw. And you can stack them later. So you could use your main camera. And if you have a CMOS camera with a low read noise, you can take 10 exposure, 10 second exposure type of things and store them and guide with them. 
Later version of the software will be able to even stack them live. That's one option. Now, over here, I'm going to do that with a two camera situation, a uh, simulator for the imaging and, and the guider, because I also want to do um, two things is narrow band imaging, which will be difficult uh, with 10 second exposure anyway with the main camera. And also, I want to do focusing live because I have a non axis guider. So, this panel is all about the control of the acquisition, and the acquisition loop runs independently of the other loops. We have many threads in this application. This is a multi-thread application with different priority levels. They run uh, independently of each other. They just synchronize to each other when they need. So you can run this one and nothing else is running. But you have after that another uh, panel here where you control the guiding part and you can guide at a different rate rate than you actually uh, data get the data from the camera. It's not the case yet here, not at, le at least uh, for the, the, the guiding side, but it's going to happen uh, in the future. We'll have new version where this guiding will be predictive guiding, where you will guide faster, you will send correction to the mount faster than you get new images in order to stay on track, even if it's a long exposure over here. So that's why we have those independent loops. And the, the third here uh, panel is about focusing, which is yet another independent processing, taking image from the same source, but processing them at its rate. And this typically has a lower priority because we usually don't need to rush focusing. So we have given more priority for the processing on the guiding and acquisition. And the focusing is going to be done at lower rate. You can actually stack frames for focusing if you have low SNR. Uh, you can guide pretty well with low SNR, but it's not as good as with uh, focusing. So you may want to stack frames before you actually send correction to the focuser, and that can be done here. Anyway, so let me sh talk about those two uh, uh, here, uh, uh, viewport. This one will show you everything about guiding, uh, the, the image, the auto, uh, <coughs> the guiding correlation, the, the correlation for the, the auto-guiding. And here it will be about the, the focuser. On the bottom, uh, there are a couple of plots. You can select which one you want, you know, auto-guiding plot, mount tracking error, error reduction, talk about that later, correlation of guiding, focusing, correlation of focusing, performance, a log of the activity of the software. Okay, now it's time for me to double check here. I have selected my optical bench uh, here. I'm binning uh, here uh, by eight. The main reason I do that is because I have pretty large star in the, on, the, on the slide. Uh, but part of the binning is uh, software. The, the, the system, if you bin eight and here the camera maximum hardware binning is four, is going to bin four and then do everything else by calculation. So let me connect all the instruments. So now it's connecting to um, the camera to everything, filter wheel, the guider. And, and if I start here, the exposure, and it will tell me I'm binning. And also I can clear, click over here and se see the uh, live picture of my uh, slide. Oh, it's not a black and white, it's a color uh, coded picture to give you a bit more information about the level of the signal, but it's pretty much a monochrome image because the monochrome camera, camera over here and what we see, in fact, is the infrared light, right, uh, coming from the from uh, from the camera, from from the slide. <coughs> if you remember, uh, let me go back there very quickly, to, just to be sure, we are on the same page on this one, um, because I didn't talk about it during the explanation of the bench, but I think it makes sense to be sure everybody understands that. You know, the light coming from the slide here is going to be reflected by the beam, beam splitter of the ONA, goes through the adaptive optic, the focuser, the scope, bounce back on the flat mirror, comes through the whole system, through the adaptive, through the ONAG, uh, the dichroic filter and the infrared lights will be seen by the guider. That's what we have now. Okay, now we get those images uh, coming from uh, every few seconds, coming from the camera. Nothing is moving for the time being. So, what I can do now is starting uh, the guiding loop. 
So let's start. I, I, I can. Well, let me talk about the but the button. Just basically, there is a video I made on Sky Guide with way more explanation about how does it work. But yeah, this is for calibration uh, because you need to calibrate auto guiding like any auto guiding software. You will do the L shape type of motion. This is to start auto guiding. This is to pause to stop, and this is to decide if you want to send correction or not to uh, your mount. So you can do auto guiding without just a calculation without doing any correction and this is to take a new reference frame every time you start you will take automatically a new reference frame here i will stop sending correction to show you what, what here, we are, here we are so now what we see is the result of the calculation of the er registration error between two images all the image all the frame of the guider the reference one we took when I started over here and the new one, the incoming ones coming every every few seconds from the guider. And so far we don't see any difference. So I'm, I, I will explain a bit more what this means. It's pretty much like a guide star in terms of behavior, except it's not a star. It's a result of the calculation of everything in the field of view here. So this image is a raw image. The reference image used for focusing is processed to remove the noise floor and enhance the signal. So if you look at the process frame, you get this. And you see the comet trail is a bit gone, but we have a good picture of the stars. And this is my guiding reference image, which I can retake any time by clicking here. And this is my incoming new image. Uh, and you don't see much of any difference again, because I have a good SNR and nothing is moving yet. Now, with those two images, the system, every time it gets a new one, compute this. What is this is? This is the correlation function. It's a function with a maximum level at one, or 100% 1 correlation between both images. You can think about your both image and look at how the system works is looking at where the two images, when you change any registration, match the best. Now, if there is no difference between both image beside noise in position, they match at uh, the same location, right? There is no offset, uh, no registration. So the maximum of the correlation function is located at the cross. The cross is the location of the reference frame. And my uh, current, uh, <coughs> the red value here of my correlation, my current correlation value is 99%, almost 100%, almost one. In the blue, I'm at zero, and this is a pretty much like a bell-shaped function with a peak, and you expect the peak to stay here at the center. If the peak is moving away from the center, that means a new image coming are with some offset or registration error coming from tracking, and we're going to use this information to correct. So I can do that now by sending a a motion to the adaptive optic. I'm going to send a motion of one second to the ST4 connection. In and let's see if I can zoom in here. You may be able to to see the motion of of the raw image. It's not going to move by a lot, but you may be able to see it. So I move, let's say, on both axes a bit, and the adaptive optics should. You see, we saw the image moved and he should have moved in both directions now, you see. So the correlation peak moved away from his reference point uh, the same way the whole image did, because the calculation found between this and that, you can see it, there is a slight variation now in position. So to get the best correlation be between those both, ima both images, you need to be there, offset by something. You are not at zero, zero anymore. Well, that's something is over there on the display. We have a collection of information coming live. We see the uh, X and Y errors, usually RA and DEC, are minus three and plus three uh, pixels over here, coming from the motion I just gave to uh, the adaptive optics. And that translates to uh, this uh, correction if I want to make one. No, those corrections are in red because I'm not signing the correction. So those fields have different color codes uh, uh, 
value. So if you are in red, that means for correction, the correction is not applied. If it's green, it's applied. On those fields, if you have red, that means the error is in a relative low range. If you are uh, orange, it's a bit more. If you are red, you have a large error. This gives you a way to see uh, at glance if something is going on wrong. You can select pixel image or arc second. That's a choice you can make anytime. You also see the error here on the plot of the auto guiding. We we see a jump here and a jump there coming from the, the motion of, of the of the adaptive optic and the correlation. Of course, we have a mean and RMS value, RMS. And there is this auto guiding and, and error, which is what you have here. And another one I'm going to talk about later. OK, let's start. Let's put that full frame. Let's start auto guiding. Now I'm going to tell the system, yes, you can send correction uh, to my mount, which would be an adaptive optic in that case. So he's sending those corrections as we speak. And he's going to bring my uh, my peak of correlation here, which in mean the image is coming back to where he was. So I want to make it clear, we are not computing any centroid of any stars. The software doesn't know what he's looking at. The only calculation, the only assumption made by the algorithm is the nature of the noise. So we use uh, multivariate statistical tools to do a calculation and a modelization of the noise to extract whatever signal from the noise. But the shape of what's there doesn't matter for the job. It looks like it's a star here, but it's not. Of course, I can crop. We have the capability to crop and decide to guide only with one or few stars here, or with a comet only, if I want to track a moving target. If I have a non-axis guider, I could do that. And in that case, you will be close to a, to a simple single star guiding. Yet, there is no centroid calculation. It's truly a, a digital image correlation. So now, if, like now, you are connected to a scope, and the scope is, is, is low for any reason to a new target, then the system will detect that automatically and stop guiding and wait until you are tracking again and take a new reference. You can add a delay if you wish and restart uh, guiding and focusing uh, uh, when you are uh, settled on your new target automatically. And that's independent of the, the type of imaging software or scheduling software you are using. You just need to have an ASCOM driver uh, for your mount. You can share with another software. Now, if you have a problem to share an ASCOM driver with a mount, uh, I'm sorry, with, between different software like the mount or um, the camera, there is a handy tool from Optech, which I use very often, is the uh, ASCOM server. The ASCOM server from, from Optech is a piece of software, which is, you know, a server, who allows an hardware to be shared between many applications uh, as, so, as long as they have uh, an ASCOM driver. And that, I think, it costs 25 bucks. It's a very handy tool. So if you have any problem to actually share a driver between two applications, ASCOM driver between several applications, you may want to consider this subtech uh, server who does a good job to do that clean. OK, so now I'm, uh, I'm guiding. I'm back to where I was before. Everything is, is settled. So let's now move the scope to another location, not far away from where I am, and see what's happened if I move, let's say, over here on this target and say slew. Slew the scope, sorry, over here and see what's happened here. You see the status now is slewing. Guiding has stopped. The guide reference is gone. He's going to take a new one. Of course, you're not going to see any difference here because also I slew, I slew, I slew the scope. Uh, that's a simulator. I didn't move uh, anything on my bench because I have only the adaptive optic there. So I still have the image of my, uh, my uh, comet. Right, but that shows you the concept. If you would have a scope connected, an actual scope, then you will have a new image here and the system will guide. The nice thing here is you don't need to look at where are my guide stars. Uh, you just start to guide right away. And if you have a large field of view with the zero, for instance, I have here an, an axis guider or guide scope for that matter, you will always have a star um, available 
at least one to do the job with few, with few second exposure. So you don't care, the system automatically track and keep going. And if I, that's my new reference frame, which is like the, the one before because it's still the same slide. We have a, a feature here which work only if you have an internet connection. You don't need an internet connection to use the software. You, you need that to use this feature if you want to use it. And this is simply, simply a map. You can select among different maps available out there. I'm going to take the digital sky survey. And I can um, search an object and, and go to the object and move the mount and, and do everything, uh, everything like I have done with uh, the sky X here. I can do it over here and, and, and have a look uh, where I am now. I, I, I see the star, the object, so, and you have different type of uh, imagery you can select if you wish. So the value you see here are the same than the sky X in that case, or your imaging software in control of your mount. Now, let's me, let me talk a bit more about those uh, auto guiding and mount tracking seeing error, what they mean. Well, the first auto guiding information, the error, the mean, RMS, and the correction, there is no correction over here, are the closed loop error, the auto guiding error. The error you have in most auto guiding software is, a, is, is the closed loop error, the error after you corrected. This is what you see here. However, what you want to do is to be sure when you close the loop, your error is less than it was before you close the loop. But you don't know what the error was before you close the loop. So the open loop error is available now here. This is your open loop error. That's the error you would have in your system if you do nothing, if you don't sign any correction or you use zero aggressiveness to, to pick a number. So you will have this, um, this error over here. So let's, let's do like we did before, let's do a motion for instance and clear the statistics. And the system now is guiding, so it's going to see the motion in, in one direction and it's going to correct. So now we see errors, right? Now, what should happen after a while, it's this closed loop error should eventually be less than the uh, tracking error. That will tell you that your system is doing a good job because if the uh, Auto guiding error is more than the tracking error before I correct, why I would correct, right? And that may happen if you are chasing noise, like the thing. Eventually, you may have a lower error uh, open loop than you have when you close the loop because you are trying to chase noise, and chasing noise never gives you anything positive. So that is mainly useful when you are actually guiding on an object with some level of noise from the mount and from the thing. Anyway, I, I thought I'll mention that uh, capability where you can compare uh, the two errors and uh, over here and look at them uh, to see if you are actually improving the, the situation and, and decide your aggressiveness and exposure time based to this type of feedback. You have also a plot with the guiding correlation who tells you how good your correlation is, the SNR and, and things like that because if the correlation becomes too small, uh, there are options in the advanced tab to decide to stop guiding or focusing. Uh, if you, there is a cloud coming and you see the signal drop, such the correlation drops, and we, we can stop. Okay, now let's start to uh, use the focus aspect of the system because we have an, an axis guider. We have this capability to do live focus with the astigmatism on the guider side. So I'm going to switch to the uh, focusing uh, plot now. Connect the focuser and start the autofocus. I'm not going to send any correction for the time being. And what you're going to see are the classical values you see on, on the logis software like uh, focus lock. You get the relative and absolute uh, roundness and those information for uh, the correction of the focuser. And here you see the shape uh, of, uh, of your uh, stars or your image, and normally it should be a nice round uh, a picture here, this uh, 
correlation, focusing correlation. It's not because my stars are elongated. That's part of the fact I was tracking the comet against the star field. And that's, that means this is the shape I want when I'm at best focus. But the reality is my, uh, uh, my, my shape, my circularity is, my roundness, but this way, is 5.6%. But the system used this reference one done during calibration, which is small, knowing that's the right shape for the job. Normally, you would have a nice round stuff, but if you have different filters, you have the capability to select uh, different filters here. And for each filter, you can set a different target for the shape. If you are not totally parfocal, what's going to happen is uh, those values may be different. So you, you can calibrate per, per filter like you do with focus load. It's pretty the same thing, except this calculation of the shape of your image, the, the distortion, the, the, the out of focus of the image, which is seen through the astigmatism of the guider with the ONAG, is computed across the whole image again, not with a single star, but with all the image at once. So let's move the focuser. <clears throat> and I'm going to stop all corrections, still doing the calculation though. And I'm going to move the focuser, let's say uh, 500 steps. See what's happened. And this is a focuser position. <clears throat> and you will see the focuser moving will have two effects on the system. The first one, you change the shape here. You see now you become elongated the other way, which tell us in which direction to move the focuser. Is why we can do live focus. And here you see a smaller registration error coming from the motion of the focuser because I move by 500 steps. It's quite a lot. So that results in some uh, error due to the mechanic of the focuser. And of course, in a normal uh, process, when you are imaging, you move by a few, few steps at a time. So this motion is negligible, is in the microns, and is corrected by auto-guiding anyway. But now I stop the auto-guiding, but if I start auto-guiding here, it will correct for this as we go. And you can see how uh, uh, we'll show you uh, the, the blur image coming from the motion of the focuser I just gave the manual motion, we see the step here and here the variation of the, the roundness value, which is positive in that direction. Now I can say, okay, let's start auto focus and the system will automatically move the focuser back to the right position. Because it's a large variation, you may still see some motion here of the, the main uh, of the frame because we are moving the focuser and we are correcting in the same time the error. But that's okay, again, due to the fact I'm sending pretty large correction to the focuser at once. And you see the image become sharper and sharper as it should. Now, the process here is doing both things in the same time, focusing and guiding combined live with uh, the whole image. And there is no assumption made about what is in image. It could be your dog, your cat, your car, a UFO, uh, whatever it may be. That's uh, almost back there to uh, the, the best focus. We'll be at best, best focus when we are below 1% here. Uh, and, and then what we could do just to show you is to move the focuser the other way around. Uh, this way I'm going to move the focuser inward will defocus the image as well <clears throat> and we'll see the now I'm still correcting as we go so we should see for a little while the, the image blur and hopefully it took my order did I click I don't remember because I didn't hear anything uh, no I don't think he moved okay let's stop that stop correction stop correction and move the focuser 500 step should move. He is not do, doing any any correction because I told him not to do any. Ah. Here we see the focuser is going down pretty a lot. So now I have to restart. Well, let me let me. I, I think I did too much. I did twice now. Let's stick at 500 steps. It's good enough. Because after that, I may be out of range of the capability of the autofocus. 
if he becomes too blur. In this focuser, 500 step is uh, almost a one millimeter. Okay, so now I'm elongated the other way more. I can restart the uh, autofocus. And it's going to, uh, again, correct for the focus. And, and uh, any change in, uh, in registration of the image. Now, I said before, in this 32-bit version, there is a one megapixel limitation for the guider. Uh, that's a legacy from Maxim, and even if you don't use Maxim, and also it's not very fast because it's a 32-bit version, but the 64 wouldn't have that. If you work to, want to work around that, you can bin. And I tell usually people who have long enough focal lengths, like a meter or more, to bin their guider, because most guiders have small pixels. And by the way, the resolution of the calculation here is a tenth of a pixel. So you can bin 4 by 4 you are still having quite a lot of resolution for, for guiding and for focusing. So we are almost back in track here. But if you don't want to be no, uh, by four, and this is a 16 megapixel camera, I need to be by four at least to go to the megapixel limit. I can crop, but if I crop, I lose some of the field of view. And here I have an axis guider with a large uh, field uh, a guider. It will be um, not, not the best things to do to crop the image unless I want to track a specific part of the image. So what I can do is another trick. Um, and let me stop this for the little while. I'm going to stop both. This time I'm going to stop the um, the autofocus and the, the guiding or even everything. So, and I'm going to show you another option. So the, this was designed in order to compress the image without losing any information. So, okay, okay, good. So here I can tell the system to do what we name block compression. So let's say two. And what block compression two means? Well, it means like an image like that is going to cut, split the image in two by two, which gives you four sub images, four quadrants here. And he's going to take the four and stack them together in one fourth of an image. So basically, he's going to add this, qu this quadrant with that quadrant with that quadrant with that quadrant on a single quadrant. If you use a tree, then it will be nine by nine and stuck, add them together in one uh, subframe. But this subframe, subframe has the sum of all those uh, stars, whatever is in the field. So you don't lose anything, but you compress the data you're going to process. So if I do it now, which I selected a factor four for the two for the block compression, which means compressing by four, and for one my one mega my 16 megapixel, I will be at one megapixel like I want. What I see is that if I click now here to restart the acquisition and and look at my new uh, image here going to see uh, something interesting. Well, first, first there is a change in color because that change will be the stretch of the image. You see my, uh, my comet is split in pieces and everything is now in a quarter of the frame size packed together. I think you will see better if I start over here the auto guiding loop and show you the, um, the guiding reference, you see? This is my new reference frame, and typically we see a piece of the comet here, a piece of the comet there, and everything has been compact with the same scale, a quarter of the size field of view in terms of the sensor, but not in terms of the field of view of the camera, which means we don't lose anything for guiding. And, and as far as guiding goes, it doesn't change anything. We are still here guiding, and if I move my, uh, my, move my, uh, my slide a bit, I will see a motion of the slide, a motion of the correlation, and I can start auto guiding with this uh, block compressed image like I did before. I can do focusing as well, all of this. It's not going to be different. And I can compress uh, up to the level I want, which could be handy uh, even with a 64 bit version because it may speed up the calculation and provide you uh, uh, <coughs> the same result basically. 
And, and he can do that because he doesn't care even if it split the star in two or the comet, because he doesn't look for a guy star. He looks at the old shape of, of the image up there. Well, I think I'm pretty much at the end of the presentation. The software is available for download for a 60 days free trial. We are in a beta. We'll have uh, uh, the software uh, available for sale after uh, those 60 days sometime in, fe in January, February next year. The 64 bits is coming. We have an integration uh, ongoing with S SGP to add in their GUI the capability to use this software for guiding and focusing. Uh, such user can directly connect uh, and use it through uh, SGP. Here you see the example with the SkyX. Uh, with this ASCOM connection, you can work pretty much with everything you want. If you move the filter wheel, then we'll see that uh, over here automatically because uh, we have uh, the connection to the ASCOM of the filter wheel. Okay, I think I'm done with my presentation. So I guess now I need to bring back my screen, right? Uh, first, you still hear me? Yes, yes, we're still here. Okay, um, so I, 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 got, I can't... We have a couple of questions for you from okay, outside okay. the room. Yes, go ahead. One is, uh, is ONAG required for this? Now, the answer is no. No for the guiding. Uh, the guiding doesn't need an, an axis guider. He can guide with an on axis, an off axis, a guide scope, uh, a self guided camera. The only time where you will need an ONAG is uh, for the live focusing because you need to use this astigmatism effect on the guider side to know where the focus is and move the focus without doing the V-curve and, and with the shutter open of the imaging camera. Having said that, if you have an ONAG, you have a large field of view at once and when you guide, you have access to a large field of view, which is always a good thing. But it will work with even a single star and a, an off-axis guider. And, and the second question was, w will it also work with the, the Optec Lacerda? The Optec, sorry, with which one? The, the, you, know, you know the little astigmatism introducer uh, Optec cells? Ah, uh, the Lacerta, yes. Lacerta, yeah. Uh, the, the answer uh, is yes, it should work, but I haven't done any tests with this one yet, because Lacerta is based on an off-axis guider with usually only one guide star and with some level of distortion. No, I would suspect it would, because the shape doesn't matter much, but I don't have the experience to answer the question. On the principle, yes, he should. Mm -hmm. For the focus side, right? For the guiding, I'm sure he will. Guiding, he will guide with pretty much anything. For the focusing part, uh, we'll have to try. But he should. Um. Eric's also asking, uh, is it going to work with uh, ACP? Well, ACP works with Maxim DL, right? So it should work uh, because we can do this connection with Maxim through the Maxim connection. I didn't show here, but we can do that on the 32-bit version. On a 64-bit version, it wouldn't work straight because uh, you will have probably to uh, do something on the ACP side to launch it also maybe to synchronize it. I, I don't know if the 64, if you don't connect to Maxim, then you may have some difficulty to use it 64-bit uh, version. The 32 should, yes. Okay. And uh, Terry, I'm not, I'm not following your question. If you want to come live and ask yourself. Yes. Uh, does that, um, given this uses ASCOM drivers, will this work with SBIG cameras? No. Actually, SBIG camera came with ASCOM driver pretty late in the game, as far as I know. ASCOM is a, is a standard across the uh, manufacturer of devices, camera and, and others. So most camera those days have an ASCOM driver. There are old camera who have only a uh, native driver who will work only with some software like uh, Maxim. But any camera having an ASCOM driver will work. The Zio camera you see here, it's uh, a Zio ASI with an ASCOM driver. I think if I remember well, um, SBIG was uh, releasing ASCOM driver for their camera. I'm not sure where they are with that, but uh, most camera, if not all now, have ASCOM driver. 
Well, some of the older cameras don't, but the software work also work with Maxim, so. That's right. And okay. so you, you should see me now, right? Instead of the screen, I'm right? Yes. Yeah, yeah the, the trick is uh, if, if you don't have, if you have um, Maxim, that's one of the reasons we have the, the 32-bit version legacy with Maxim. If one of the reasons, ACP and also uh, the capability to use Maxim as a proxy in that case to access your camera driver if you don't have an ASCOM one. So, so, sorry, say it again. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm saying with Maxim, you can use Maxim as a proxy to access uh, your camera using a native driver which is available in Maxim if you don't have uh, an ASCOM driver for that camera. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. There yeah. are some cameras that, yeah. uh, like the old SPIC cameras, that uh, Ter Terry has a STL 11000, which there is no ASCOM driver for. Right. And, but there is an ASCOM Maxim driver for it. So in his case, um, he'll be able to use it that way. Now, keep in mind, if you use a software like the SkyX, to pick an example, or SGP or whatever for imaging and scheduling, all of this stuff, and is in control of your imaging camera with a filter wheel, everything like that, those doesn't, you know, for those, uh, you do whatever you want. What, because we don't control them. Uh, what you need is an ASCOM driver for the guider. If you don't want to go through Maxim. And most guiders those days, as far as I know, have ASCOM drivers. Right. So, uh, do you guys have any questions from inside the room? If uh, not, we'll uh, get into the time anyway, so. Toga, this is Dennis. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so, Gaston, have you quantified the guiding accuracy of this full frame approach versus regular use of uh, the ONAG? And the second question, um, do you have to calibrate for each run or will the software automatically correct for changes in deck? Well, for the first question is the, the quality of the guiding is at least the same. I would say it could be better uh, depending on the, the quality of your guide star. If you use a guide star with a centroid calculation, you may have two issues. One is the seeing coming to at play here with scintillation. And because centroid calculation assumes something about the shape of the star, I've seen in some software problems with short exposure uh, because scintillation and the centroid jump around uh, because that. Here, you wouldn't see much of that because we don't compute any centroid. So it's more robust in that in that matter. Um, so, and also if you are off axis, um, uh, you may have some other uh, artifacts from the optics, uh, like uh, coma, or the things who may incre increase your problem with a single guy star if you assume he has a known shape, which we don't assume. No, I'm not totally sure I understood, Denise, uh, the second question, though. So, so let me, sorry, so let me ask the question again. So if I were to calibrate, let's say, at a given location in the sky, <clears throat> and then um, I want to slew somewhere else. Do you have to recalibrate or will uh, the software based on the um, feedback from the mount knowing what ARIA and DEC I'm now at recalibrate? The no, the answer is yes. You will recalibrate. Well, basically, the answer is no. You don't have to do a new calibration. If you connect to the mount, and then the software will retrieve the uh, deck and peer side and it will know what to do like any auto guiding software so you do the calibration once and you're good now if you change the optics or anything you may have to consider a new calibration but otherwise you don't have to do that if you don't connect to the mount then you will have to provide the deck uh, the peer and and also the uh, deck value for um, the, the peer side and the deck value otherwise it's automatic okay thank you you're welcome. The, this is going to be pretty interesting where, because until now, 
all automation software had to pick a guide star. Yeah. Uh, I guess with 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 this, they're gonna skip that step. Yeah, I, I actually, not only, is, but I think I forget to show you something. If I can share my screen one more time, let me show you go something. Ahead. May I? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so I click on this one again, and we should see my screen. Let me know when you see the screen. We can now. You you can now. Okay, let me go back here. Stop. <clears throat> And and just go back to the normal process where I don't use a block compression because it's easier to see that way. Okay, now I'm going to start the, uh, the acquisition again, and and I'm also going to start guiding. I'm show you something which will answer partially the question uh, on a practical way. One of the questions from Denise about the quality of the guiding uh, here. So now I'm, I'm full frame again, right? So I'm guiding with everything here in the field of view. And I'm going to show you what's happened if, you know, there is an advanced uh, parameter here, which is what is the uh, minimum correlation you want before you stop guiding. And I set it pretty low, 25%. And that may happen if you have, uh, for instance, uh, clouds coming. But you select the value you want. But and so far, we are at 99, right? And I think some of you have seen the same demonstration here on the previous demo demo uh, software. I'm, I'm going to dim, because I have a power supply here, I'm going to dim the light uh, in, you know, the source in front, in, behind the slide. So I'm going to dim the stars, basically. You know, I'm, I'm a bit playing God, but he, with this system, I can, I can do that. And I'm going to dim it, and you will see the result is the star will start to fade away on the on the image you see so i'm going to continue to dim again keep going my power supply is not very accurate so i have to, to go very slowly it's jumping the potentiometer is jumping around everywhere now you see my correlation is down to 85 percent because the signal is going down still still enough for uh, the, the the guiding uh, aspect if you if it's too low for the focusing, then we just start this uh, stacking process and stack frames. We are not in a rush anyway for uh, the focus part. Okay, now I'm 72 percent uh, of correlation, 28. I'm below, close to my threshold. Okay, so now if you see, I is moving around because my power supply is not very stable, but we don't see much of anything here. But if you look at the, the guiding input processed by the system for the calculation, you see, it still registers stuff. And is able to extract them from the noise floor. So now if I move the, um, the again, the, a bit the adaptive optic, also you won't see anything here. Uh, we should see uh, a motion over here coming from the detection of the, the, the cooler here we see here. The fact we move the, the adaptive optic and I can start, uh, actually I'm, I'm doing as we speak, uh, auto guiding anyway. So I, I'm sending correction to the, to the, to the mount or the, and we go back here. So that was just to show you, we can work with SNR way below what uh, Centroid can do. So that's one of the other aspect of these technologies. You can work with very low SNR because the way we process, it, I don't want to go too deep in that, but mathematically speaking, it's all about looking at the nature of what you see on the image. You know, the noise has a structure pretty much understood because the noise is a random process and, and we do a multivariate statistic of the noise. Even a single star close to the noise floor has a different shape, uh, different structure, and and next to uh, pixel values from the noise floor because they don't they, there is a cluster aggregation of them which has a different signature in the multivariate statistic noise analysis than, than the noise itself. So we can work with SNR close to the noise floor. Well, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that and bring you the control of the screen. That's, yes, that's to tell you we don't need a guide star to speak of. Okay, so we have some more questions. Uh, actually, questions are coming pretty fast. So uh, let me try to keep up with them. So the first question was, 
uh, uh, does it uh, support tethering? Not yet. Uh, it's going to happen soon. Uh, we are in the process to implement detring which means every time you target, take a new target or you change the filter, you could deter. It's not yet on this version, but it will be available soon. Okay. Um, one question, one other question was, uh, does this require a guide camera or can, can both be done, guiding and imaging be with the same camera? Yes, you can. That's what I said earlier. But you cannot mm -hmm. do the live focus though, because the live focus requires the astigmatism from the on-axis guider. But yes, mm -hmm. you can, you can, we have an option at this stage to uh, store the image coming from the camera. And when I say the camera is any camera, so the acquisition loop can take any camera and guide with that. And in the next generation, in the future, we'll have more opportunities to actually stack them live and sort them, some sort of lucky imaging, if you wish, stack them and uh, add them together. And, and I, I think that, that that will be a there was a presentation from bob if i remember uh, in the advanced as, in the astro imaging channel back then a year or two ago about a, a solution like that and i'm in contact with him um and it's based on the mac uh, application here but it's the same id looking globally at the early image to find the registration and stack them as you go by uh, by some type of uh, sorting mechanism based mm -hmm. on the quality of the image so yeah the answer you can already do it now because we store them and you can post, post, process them for stacking later okay. but uh, by, by the way just to be sure you will be limited to one megapixel with the 32-bit version but the 62 would not so you can take a full frame of a big camera without an issue is that the reason why you were binning 8 by 8 yes okay yeah, for two reasons one was because my camera is 16 megapixels and the block compression is better, but if I start with the block compression, nobody understands the slide, <laughs> uh, what they see. And the other one is uh, because my uh, stars in my slide are pretty big. They were taken with a different opt optic than the bench. So it was better to, to actually uh, bin them more. Okay. But uh, the 64-bit would not have this limitation. Mm -hmm. And that follow, goes to the following question. Do you need any uh, special processor or do you need a bigger computer or a, <clears throat> a existing computer? Will that be able to do the, uh, your guiding and focusing? No, I'm using a pretty much a standard laptop. Mine is probably three years old. So it's not mm -hmm. funny, fancy computer, it's a laptop. If you want to store all the frames for post-processing, you may want to have enough memory to do so, to store in a hard drive or an external drive. If, because so far we don't stack them live. We stack frames for uh, focusing live, but as soon as we are done with them, we just drop them and we start again. So we don't store them. Uh, but uh, when we will have the capabilities to stack live, then that may save some memory, but uh, the memory may be an issue for stacking the frames if you save all of them. For the computing, no, there is no much, unless you want to go a tenth of a second uh, tracking, but I wouldn't recommend to do that because you will face too much problem with seeing. So I would suggest to use few seconds anyway. Most months will just do fine with that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what about uh, operating system? Is this only available on Windows? Yes, so far it's Windows 7 and higher. Okay. Um, I, I seem to miss, the, miss a question earlier. Uh, it says, uh, it's, it's a statement in form, in form uh, of a question. It says, you could ignore guiding and focusing in your sequencer application. Uh, so I'm assuming yes, right? You could yes. just- uh, Yeah, that's one of the reasons we are working with people like SGP, for instance. And we have <laughs> this legacy with Maxim uh, for SCP folks. It's because you, you you just want to go and, and think about focusing and, and, and guiding anymore in your uh, system. And there is another software which is not available anymore uh, for a little while at least for uh, uh, for download. But it's named Sky Surveyor. Sky Surveyor is doing all of what you see plus mosaic management. Uh, but we, we took it away for the time being because we focus on this technology first. But, 
But if you do mosaic with uh, SGP, for instance, you can do that. When you do mosaic, the problem you may find out is you may have to rotate or tweak a bit your tile, not because you want so, but because you need the dark guide star, <laughs> if I can say so. And, 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 and you have to stop to refocus on all of that, finding another star bright enough if you do a V-curve. Here, the idea is not to do that, is to be able you know, to take the tile you want based on your mosaic only, and for every time you take a tile, then you get what is inside the tile to do the job. Focus and guiding as you go and you forget about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is going to be very interesting. I definitely want to yeah. give it a try. Sure. Well, it's there to try. I mean, we already have some beta tester. We got some feedbacks. We did some modification. One of the things we learned by people it's the interface looks complex because they have a lot of information. So I'm an engineer first. You know? So of course, I like to see data. And, and there are a lot of interesting stuff like the open loop, closed loop error, stuff like that. But it may be too much data for some people. So we're going probably based on the feedback to release a version where at start, there will be a quick interface where it will be much simpler. And then you can access the more advanced interface if you want to help people uh, to get uh, uh, sooner uh, a good idea of does it work. It's not that complex, but, you know, I, I totally understand people who think it's a bit, uh, it's new too, to be honest with you. So because it's new, it, it may look some more complex too. Okay. Oh, uh, there's another question here from Dennis. Uh, I almost missed. Uh, how are you dealing with bad pixels? Okay, um, the version you saw here do that by, uh, uh, filtering the image uh, in the statistical processing, there is a median filter among that to take care of the bad pixels. Uh, we'll probably add the capability to take uh, bad pixel uh, table or stuff like that, uh, dark frame. For uh, But so far, the processing of the noise reduction, median filter and everything else, multivariate, takes care of those pretty well. Right. You don't have to be worried with them. Okay. So uh, it's get it's uh, we're getting to that time. It's uh, ten thirty. We've been on for an hour. Uh, if everybody's done and uh, we have no more questions, uh, we'll call the night. Uh, oh, here's a quick question: Is there a restriction on the size of the sensor? Uh, like Estan said, there is a restriction on megapixels right now. Currently on the thirty-two bit version. There's a one megapixel, so you either got to use crop, small, use a small sensor, or uh, find another way. But with the 64-bit, there is no restriction, correct? That's right. And you can use this block compression I showed you before, mm -hmm. which, uh, which with the guider, which provide you easy access to the megapixel level to comply with the 32-bit restriction and maxim, uh, but uh, without losing the field of view. Not not using any stars for for the process. Oh, I I, I just uh, came up with a question. I just do, do you have a price point set for this? I know there's a sixty day trial, but what is the price after the sixty day trial? Yeah, the introduction price we have in mind for the software, uh, the the basic one who does auto guiding only, the the sky guide. You saw the sky guard here who does sky guiding and focusing. Uh, the the basic one will be around fifty bucks. Uh, at least at start, and the uh, the sky so guard guiding only, guiding only full frame. Yes, mm -hmm. the one you saw now will be around 150 for the guiding and focusing. To compare, uh, for instance, focus lock is around uh, 100, I think, for the focus mm -hmm. only. So that will do both plus full frame. And as we go, we may have uh, some improvement and add in the software. And we may have uh, new f features uh, who come and go. Never upgrade. I don't know yet exactly what the strategy or the price will be for those. Mm -hmm. Like the, the live stacking, uh, those type of things. Very nice. That's that's a good price. It's not. Okay. It's not. Glad, glad to hear. Yeah, so it's a reasonable price. It's not crazy. Well, I like I like at least at the for the introduction level, people have something they can use at a realistic price. Mm -hmm. And plus, it's sixty days. You know, you could use it for sixty days and decide yeah. if you. Yeah, I think it's is quite common to so provide people an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to test. 
and 60 days is a good because a lot of people give you 30 days and we, you know with the weather and everything you don't normally uh right a lot of times you don't get to test it properly well, i learned by experience when you get when you have 60 days they are for sure 30 days of rain right so <laughs> right you you you, you know. now i have the feeling you give 60 days there is 60 days of rain but that's a different story um Okay, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll end the show here. Uh, thank you for get Gaston for for the presentation. That was really interesting. You're welcome. Uh, just a reminder, we're going to be off for the next two weeks. We'll be back on December sixth. We don't have a topic yet, but uh, uh, we're working on one. Um, I'm trying to guilt trip Dave into do a uh, Pix Insight presentation. Right, David? I think it's working. <laughs> so uh, we, we'll, that's what we're probably going to do. And I think we selected a, a topic. Uh, we're going to do um, simple pixel math uh, lesson, some basic formulas and what do the symbols mean? For instance, the dollar sign T, what does that mean? How do we use them? Uh, how could we make... Uh, some basic formulas to start working with Pix Insight, with Pixel Math. So uh, that's it for tonight. So we'll see you in two weeks, December sixth. Good night.